Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, how the social we protoceratops met its sandy fate, plus rapper Faith Child asks how closely man is related to dinosaurs. Welcome to Series 2, Episode 2. That's the 2-2 episode. I'm expecting we're going to be doing lots of dinosaurs doing ballet. What more could you expect? Um, are you wearing your tutu at the moment, Dave? No, we appear to have gone off the rails in the first eight seconds. I figured, well, I, I was trying to think of a nice way of starting this other than hello, and that's where I got to. So, you know, if there were really good dinosaur for ballet, which dinosaur would it be? Light, agile, yeah. and on their toes. I'm thinking Alvinosaurus. Alvarosaurs. Alvarosaurs, that's right. They, they've only got little arms, though, so they, they can't do much waving about. Might be good for Irish dancing in that True, case. True, that's... You see, OK, so we've got Alvarosaurs for Irish dancing. Obviously, for marching, you're going to want something stompy, you know, really stompy. So maybe an yeah. ankylosaur? Yeah, um, they'd be good so, for that. <laughs> so the ballet, though, because they need long arms. So we need a dinosaur, yes. long arms, quite agile. Could be a velociraptor. Or if the mimosaurs. We had velociraptor just like... Last yeah, week, yeah, be. I was thinking that already. Yeah. Light on their toes. Bit very pretty. P- potentially quite jumpy. Also yeah. feathered. Look nice. They see, there you go. Yeah. Good. They can twirl things. But we're not going to talk about ballet anymore. We're going to talk about a dinosaur which wouldn't be very good at dancing, I'm guessing, and that is protoceratops. We are. So, I mean, for those of us who don't know what a protoceratops is, I mean, I'm thinking it's like a triceratops, but the first incarnation. So what is it? What is a protoceratops? Sp- spot on. Yes, yeah, so, right. So you're, you're most of the way there, in fact. But as usual, the naming conventions of paleontology went a bit wrong quite a long time ago. And so, yeah. Yeah, ev- everything that looked a bit like something else but was apparently a bit simpler was proto, you know, or EO or um, EIO. You know, some kind of That's McDonald's farm. EO, EIO. So some kind of prefix meaning first or early or or things like this. And you can see where they're going with protoceratops. Um yeah, it is a ceratopsian dinosaur, so are four-legged animals with a big frill and horns, only it doesn't really have horns. Um, it's got kind of a bump on the nose, which is a bit more exaggerated in some than others, and that's about it. It's got big spiky cheeks, which actually a lot of the Ceratopsians have, but we kind of overlook them because we're too interested in the big horns and overlook the spiky cheeks. And it's not very big. Two, maybe two and a half metres for a big adult. And that's from, like, horny nose thing nose, to tail? Nose to t- tail. Okay. Yeah. And there's nothing exciting on the tail or anything like that. It's just normal. So, Well, the, the tail is kind of weird, actually. So it, as you go along, it, when you get to about the midpoint, it gets really tall. So it turns into almost like a little kind of paddle shape with great big long spars off the top of the tail. Uh, and then it vanishes again by the end. So it's almost got like this paddle only in the middle, um, which is really kind of strange. That um, is odd. But it's, we can talk about that later because it, it links back to some other things. And it has a couple of other odd features as well. So one species in particular, Protoceratops andrewsi, which is named after Roy Chapman Andrews, who found it in the famous expeditions to East Asia that also turned up Velociraptor and the first dinosaur eggs. We've mentioned this multiple times, this great ex- uh, expedition expedition um P- protoceratops andrews eye has premaxillary teeth which doesn't sound very exciting but it's actually very strange so dinosaurs have a premaxilla which is the first bone at the front very front of the face and then a maxilla and in most of those so certainly in the allosaurisian dinosaurs uh, there are teeth in both. So Tyrannosaurus has teeth in its premaxilla and teeth in its maxilla. In the Ornithisians, and Ceratopsians, remember, are Ornithisians, they have a beak at the yeah. front, and that's the premaxilla. So they've dropped the teeth from the premaxilla and put a beak on it, and then all their teeth are just in the second big bone of the face, the maxilla. Except Protoceratops, which manages to have a beak in its premaxilla and then a little pair each side of, like, fang-like canines oh. that stick down. I think it's unique in being the only Ornithisian that has premaxilla maxillary teeth. You don't get that with any modern animals, do you? Because I know you get like water deer have little, yeah, I know they don't have beaks, but they do have unusual fangs. It's a bit like that. They're a bit blunter, but yeah, they're, they're like that. And there's a pair each side, so there's there's actually four of them. And these show up in, in even in relatively juvenile animals. You can often see a little bump, and so it's a really good way of telling if you've got Protoceratops andrews eye or a different So hang on. Species. So Protoceratops, it's not like... Because like Triceratops, there's just one species of Triceratops? Or there's... there's 
So there's well, so at one point I think there were fourteen named for Triceratops. We've now sorted it out and we're down to two. Yeah, there's two of Protoceratops as well, um, which again is a little unusual. You know, the vast majority of dinosaur species that we have, or dinosaur genera that we have, there's only one species. There's only Rex within Tyrannosaurus, for example. Um, but yeah, we have two of Velociraptor actually, and we have two of Protoceratops, and these two lived side by side. We we mentioned Protoceratops in the last episode as you know the there are tooth marks on bones from a velociraptor. And that's kind of why I wanted to talk about Protoceratops in a way, it, partly because it links back to that last episode really nicely, but also because it's a really, really underrated dinosaur. Um, it's not one many people know of. It's not one that you can usually find toys of. Um, it's not one that's in many museums outside the American Museum of Natural History who have like 14 of them on display. Um, but it's actually incredibly important for research because it's one of the dinosaurs that's actually probably best known from multiple good skeletons. So we said last week, you know, Velociraptor is really famous, but actually scientists don't know much about it. I would say Protoceratops is almost the exact opposite of that. We know a hell of a lot about Protoceratops. It's been the basis of lots of important research. And yet your average person hasn't heard of them and don't know what they are. Weird. So because if they're, I mean, were they very common then if there's a lot of specimens? Yeah, there are. There's loads of specimens. So the American Museum collection, obviously, they picked up loads of them. Um, loads more of them have been collected in Mongolia since. So just like Velociraptor, there's loads and loads and loads of them in southern Mongolia. But obviously, now we're talking about a medium-sized herbivore. Again, on the Chinese side in Inner Mongolia, their province, um, there's lots of stuff which may or may not be Protoceratops or may or may not be P. Andrews eye. I think we've never found anything diagnosable as P. Andrews eye. Um, but there is, there's an animal called Magna Rostris, which is definitely a Protoceratops sid, but whether or not it's exactly the same is another matter. Okay. Magna Rostris is r- really bust up, so it's the back of the skull's missing, unfortunately. Though otherwise, it's really quite a nice specimen. Well, what's really confusing me, okay, because this is called Protoceratops, right? Which makes me think, therefore, it, the cer- Triceratops came after it, because it's a Protoceratops. But you're saying it's around yes. at the same time as Velociraptors, which pre- you said was very late Cretaceous, so right when the dinosaurs yeah. died out. So did it just hang yeah. around for ages or is it not a proto ancestor? It's just a... What is it? I'm confused. Yes, it's a bit of both. Oh, no. Yeah, so Triceratops, you're talking about 65, 68 million years ago. So right at the end of the dinosaurs. And now we're talking about 71, 75. So 10 million years in the grand scheme of things, not an enormous period of time. And I, I, I think the logic made sense at the time, which was this looks like a ceratopsian. We already had triceratops. We already had Staracosaurus, um, and Centrosaurus and lots of other horned dinosaurs. And now you had this thing that was smaller and simpler and didn't really have horns and didn't have spikes around the edge of the frill. And I don't know if they knew much about the dating back then, but they could well have guessed that it was a bit older. And I imagine they looked at this and went, you know what? This is the kind of progenitor that we might expect. We expect things to get bigger over time. We expect things to get more elaborate over time. So we'll call this Protoceratops. And of course, we now know that actually, yeah, there were lots of other ceratopsians alongside it. There were loads and loads and loads of ceratopsians before it. In the grand scheme of the big family tree of ceratopsians, Protoceratops and its relatives come out relatively early. They, they, they split off before that really big split between the centrosaurines with the big nose horn and the chasmosaurines with the big brow horns. But it's a fairly late surviving member of an early branching group, if you can follow that yeah. sentence. Okay. So they, they branched off fairly early, but then they kept going for ages. I mean, a modern one would be a platypus. You know, platypus split off from the rest of mammals a long time ago, but they never went extinct and we still got them. So they, they survived a long time. So what you're saying is I'm in danger of sounding like one of those people saying, well, if we're descended from apes, how come there are there still, are still apes? apes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <but. laughs> um, so I think we've mentioned pro before, which was originally thought to be an early version of Ceratosaurus. Only pro is a Tyrannosaur, which has very little to do with the Ceratosaurs at all. It's just really enthusiastic about them. They... they <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was told no dad jokes. 
<laughs> um, but yeah, Proceratosaurus has a horn on the nose. Ceratosaurus had a horn on the nose. Proceratosaurus is smaller. Ergo, it came first and, and that's what gave rise to it. But it means we have a whole bunch of these animals which drop into odd places. And then occasionally where the dating's even been resolved, you've got the Eo or Proto animal coming after the thing that it supposedly gave rise to. And it's in a different group as well. So nobody should be allowed to name everything until you're finished. That's the rule. You know, Proceratops, you know, it was named in the 1920s. Fair enough. But yeah, the, there's there's plenty of more modern things where people have a very fragmentary animal and then stick a proto, eo, neo or similar prefix on it. And you're like, how sure are you that this is really that close to that thing or belongs in that group or is exactly from that age? And yeah, I'd say probably about half the time <laughs> they end up not being there. And yeah, as, a, as someone who has named a dozen or so species, I would avoid doing stuff like that for exactly that reason reason you're just asking for trouble so let's talk about like what it looked like so it, like you say it was a couple of meters long did you say yeah yeah two two and a half so that's small yeah but, but chunky i mean well built these are very kind of barrel chested animals relatively thick tail this is a big heavy animal and those heads yeah sure it's not your giant triceratops but I've got a couple of casts of skulls in my office because I do loads of stuff in Protoceratops. Part of the reason I want to talk about it. And yeah, they're 50 centimetres wide and 60, 70, 60, 70 centimetres long. It's like a dustbin lid. That's a lid. big old head on an animal that's not much bigger than, say, a Great Dane just stockier and with a tail. Wow. Okay. So, and were they on all fours? Yeah. So they, they've got rather longer back legs than forelegs, which most of the ceratopsians do. Um, but they come after this split where you've got the, the really early things. There's a group called cetacosaurs, the parrot lizards. And cetacosaurs were mostly running around on their back legs. Um, but at this point, we think these animals are fully quadrupedal, though, given their big back legs, they could probably rear up quite well. They've got heavy heads. Also, they're, they're mostly living in kind of deserty environments. That's not necessarily the place that there's a lot of rearing up to reach large, larger plants is an available option. Fair enough. Um, so it probably didn't do, do, do too much for them in, in that regard. Okay. Um, but yeah, they, they certainly look kind of back heavy. There's a slope down from the hind legs towards the forelegs and then a big head at the front. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're not, they don't strike me as most beautiful creatures. The sort of weird halfway through their tail is squished into a paddle. They've got their bum in the air and a massive head. I don't, I don't, I mean, you're not painting a beautiful picture. Let's talk about their horns though, because they don't, as you say, have them. They've got this weird bump on their nose. What, well, so big thing about Protoceratops and another reason to talk about them is because of the good number of specimens and here it's worth diving in not just adults and not just big adults right. which is for various reasons in the fossil records I want to talk about in another episode and we don't have many babies for most dinosaurs or any or just in general we don't have juveniles we don't get eggs very often etc Protoceratops we haven't just got loads of them like a good hundred or so we've got really big adults all the way down to absolutely tiny babies um, and even recently some were described that were embryos so you've what? got developing embryos inside eggs have preserved wow um those are very recent discoveries oh that would be a nightmare um, to try and like i i won't say dissect but uh dust but do the fossil pres preservation oh, yeah, preservation that's what i'm looking for not dusting it's a bit more complicated than dusting um <laughs> yeah it, it, it is so we've got this lovely range of sizes of animals. Uh, we've got multiple clusters of individuals together, which is really, really cool. We get that very, very rarely. Um, and we've got enough of a data set that it's the kind of animal you can look at for things like sexual dimorphism, Ooh. which is a huge question in dinosaurs and something I've written loads and loads about and I want to talk about in another episode. Um, <laughs> but a big question is, you know, basically, can you tell males from females? And in particular, are males very different from females? And protoceratops have been a bit of a... Um, um, kind of key specimen or key species for this and they've been analysed and reanalyzed multiple times looking for it and people said they can find sexual dimorphism and then they can't and then they can again um, and some of, the, some of the early papers and the work done in the um, 60s and 70s suggested that this bump on the nose was a male feature and only turned up in the biggest individuals and was probably a male thing. That looks like it's probably not the case, or at least the evidence to support that isn't very strong. And it looks like maybe just as they get bigger, they tend to exaggerate that nose. Um, they have a very close relative, which does have far more of a horn, this thing called Bagoceratops which uh, I can't remember if it's a little older or a little younger. I'm going to say it's a little younger and it comes after Protoceratops. 
But that's got more of a horn. But even then, it's not like a big triceratops horn or rhino horn in that it's a big conical thing. It's more a kind of little flat plate, though it's got a little bit of curvature and, you know, kind of pointing back towards the towards its bum sort of thing. So, um, but it, it's not going to be a stabbing weapon, let's put it that way. No, so what is it? F- I mean, I mean, why? Well, so presumably... Uh, or. Presumably is putting it the wrong way because we've I've done work on this. I've analysed this with colleagues of mine. And we've actually tested this and looked at the growth and development of the frill in particular. The nose is a slightly different kettle of fish and shown that it actually grows really rapidly as these animals get closer to maturity. And this is a very key indicator of something being uh, for sexual display or social dominance. The short version is when you're a baby, what you're interested in is surviving. You're very likely to die for lots of different reasons and finding food and growing and getting as big as possible is important so you don't put any effort and energy into growing any big show of features and we can see this you, you go out and see sheep and lambs and and cows and calves and they might have nubs of horns mm-hmm. but there is very little there until they're kind of three quarters grown or so and then suddenly they grow massive very very quickly i mean puberty has got to be so hard for some animals because i, I think our puberty is quite a yeah everybody gets very furry and and spotty and you know awkward and gangly but can you imagine having you know one day waking up and your horns are poking through that's so embarrassing mom oh pretty much but yeah we we absolutely see this in protoceratops and indeed some other things as well and that's that's exactly what you'd expect when they're babies they don't need a frill they're not looking to run the herd or fight each other off or try and win a mate they are much more interested in staying alive. And as soon as they get to the point that they're sexually mature, whoomph, this thing just expands at an absolute rate of knots. Now, the frill definitely does that. There's a hint, because the data set wasn't good enough in the work that we did, that the cheek spikes and that tail paddle are doing the same thing, which suggests that they're all some kind of combined set of signals and display features. The horn, probably less so, simply because there is a fair bit of variation in the nose, but it could well be that that's another feature, but because it's a very minor one and we don't have it on many specimens, it was very hard to measure. Okay. Um, So what about the cheek spikes? What, What on earth are they for? I think they're just part of the same thing. Again, they're not really there for fighting. They're kind of play like um and even in the big protoceratops they're actually really rounded so it's much more like a kind of exaggerated kids drawing of a hill rather than tend to use the word spike and it sounds like it's got a round base and it's just a cone with a i mean I, I, I'm, I'm reaching back to um when we had ralph i mean cake boss ralph on and he was talking about their cheeks and how because like i mean if you have a look say i don't know if you've ever seen those pictures they have of like hi- hippopotamus skulls and they look really spiked and angry and that sort of thing but actually if you look at a hippopotamus it's really round and lovely yeah once you put all the hippo back on you can't see all the <laughs> madness underneath exactly so i mean could it be that these cheek spikes were just entirely consumed in their heads or do you think they actually served the purpose of saying look at me i'm a grown-up i don't think so i th- i think i think they are they wouldn't be buried because again we we see them in ceratopsian after ceratopsian they're often you know they're very close to the to the frill so basically the the, the cheek spike that's Formal term is a dugal boss because it's a bone. Ooh. The dugal is the bone that it's on. I like the name dugal. That's a good name. Dugal. That's a nice. You get, you know, well behind the jaw. So they're, you know, we talk about cheeks. And of course, in humans, that's the bit that kind of goes round your teeth. We talk about well posterior to that. So these are sat behind the last teeth in the jaw. So it's quite a long way back. And then they stick right out and they come back in again. And then the frill immediately expands from the point that they've come back in. Um, so they really are quite closely connected to this, the rest of the frill and the ornamentation and the, and the display. Uh, so I think it's almost certain that they're part of that. Uh, and again, they stick out too far as well, a long way out from the face. You'd have to have an awful lot of self tissue to cover them up. And there's no particular reason to have stuff there with the hippos. It's at least all lips and flesh around the front of the mouth. And obviously that's got key things to do with eating. Uh, and to a degree being hydrodynamic as well. And you don't really need to do that if you've already got a beak. Right. Yeah. I, 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 and you've got, you know, little weird fangs for no reason. But let's let's not talk about the weird fangs again. I'm really curious about this tail 
because the tail thing in my head I'm thinking it's like a normal big chunky tail then it turns into a newt tail and then it goes chunky again or am I completely misimagining this it's chunky the whole way along mm. but in the middle it is much more newty with that crusty bit exaggerated crest along the top so that will that will run the whole length because so the neural spine so this is the bit of the so each vertebra in your body has a neural spine and that is the bit that sticks up out of it you can feel you know when you run your fingers down the back of your necks and you Bumpy. feel a row of bumps yeah that's the top of your neural spines it's just in us they're really quite flat and there's not a lot there so they're big anchors for muscles um in and they will be doing the same job in protoceratops at least at the base of the neural spine but again this big crest along the middle and this big exaggerated rise at the top um it's hard to imagine it would do very much you can elongate neural spines like that for several reasons. One is actually to make a paddle to swim. Probably not relevant in a desert-dwelling animal. Um, well, unless the can... desert floods like one week a year. It's unlikely to be flooding. Uh, <laughs> deserts probably I don't do that. Theory. At least this desert probably didn't do this. Um, well, you're not a million miles off, so people have suggested that some of these could swim quite well, in part because of the tail, but... They have no other features that would line up with a swimming swimming animal. So they're not swimming. Um, the second thing you can do is hold up heavy things. So you look at something like a horse skeleton or a buffalo, and they have really big neural spines. There's this giant hump in the shoulders. And then that's to hold uh, to attach a bunch of ligaments and some muscles to hold the head up. Maybe that's what it is in Protoceratops, only the tail isn't that big and heavy mm. to hold itself up, and you'd want the biggest spines to be at the base of the tail, not halfway down the tail. So that kind of rules out swimming and it kind of rules out holding up big heavy things. And the other way you might do that is to turn it into more of a display feature. That, at least in part, is our interpretation. Again, we, we measured a few tail vertebrae that we had available and it looked like the tail, the neural spines grew really quickly as the animals grew. The problem is we were doing that off like half a dozen measurements because getting hold of measurements of the babies was an absolute nightmare. Uh, so we did suggest this in a paper and said, look, we've measured this and we've got a trend line through a few data points but it's a rubbish trend line through very few data points so maybe we need to have a look at this but we're not sure i have i've, I've developed my own theory based on no science <laughs> and uh, the last 30 seconds yes, yes. Uh, okay <laughs> so so what it is is yes it happens um the reason you need them so big isn't for display it's because um on there you have some sort of fleshy bits like flappy skin about there whereby baby ones can grab on and bite on and then be dragged along by the, the parent. Therefore, you need the extra strength in that particular part of the tail and not the rest of it. Or, or I just thought of another one. <laughs> two hypotheses, yeah. Come on, number two. They were detachable, like you get in lizards, so they'd fall off at that point, you know, and then wiggle so that the other, the other, like, like, like you'd be attacked by a, by a, a velociraptor. You can, you can leave your tail to wiggle and distract the velociraptor and run away. So, so that's a thing called autotomy. And yeah, a bunch of lizards do this um, and it has been suggested I don't think it's ever been suggested for dinosaurs it's been suggested for some other Triassic reptiles uh, and I don't think there's very good evidence for anything oh. that isn't a lizard though there are there's a fossil lizard from um, Germany from the same beds that we get Archaeopteryx from and there's a lovely little lizard skeleton and then halfway down the tail it stops and then there's an impression in the rock and if you shine UV light on that, you can see the cartilage is still preserved. Ooh. And so that's absolutely a tail that was lost and then has regrown as cartilage, but hasn't turned to bone. And that's a recovered lizard. So we can even see things like that in the fossil record. It's such a cool but trick, that. Yes, but we haven't seen that for dinosaurs. <sighs> and I don't think that's the case for protoceratops oh. to ruin your dream. Well, you know, I... I, I shatter your I have to, illusions. I have to give you all of these other theories. Otherwise, you know, you might not think about it. So let's talk... We talked a bit about, <laughs> um, you know, sexual dimorphism. You said you wanted to come back onto it. So let's talk about what is the difference between boy protoceratops and girl protoceratops, or do we not know? Well, that's the thing. We we just don't really know. Um, it's, it's a group that have been suggested to show it, but um, my analysis uh, with some colleagues and that of others... Uh, fairly recently have shown actually there's no really good signal. There's almost certainly males and females there, but we just can't necessarily pull them apart, which is annoying. But it's also very interesting because even if we can tease them apart, we'll still be left with both animals having big frills and big cheek horns and tail flaps and uh, these premaxillary teeth, which is really kind of neat because... 
people often confuse sexual dimorphism with being some kind of big binary thing where males look like one thing and females look like other things. You know, uh, you know, male and female deer, for example, or you know, lions and lionesses. Um, it, it goes far beyond that because all, all dimorphism means is two shapes, and obviously when that's Two very clearly different things. That's a bit more obvious. But there, for example, there's loads and loads of antelope in Africa where males and females both have horns. But those horns are different shapes because they're doing different things. And males are primarily fighting other males with their horns. And females are primarily fighting off predators with their horns. And so natural selection has given them different shapes. So those animals are still dimorphic even though they both have horns. Um, things like seals and sea lions, lots of them, males are just much, much, much bigger versions of females. There are some other differences as well, but in, in the grand scheme of things, that's primarily the difference. We'd still call that dimorphism, even though their shape is pretty similar. So we call that size dimorphism. Um, so it tells us that whatever these, whatever is going on, these frills are clearly doing fairly similar things in both animals if they're present in both males and females. Um, and maybe there are some differences there and maybe males are much bigger or something like that but that doesn't mean that f females are frillless or hornless and aren't displaying or aren't using them and indeed that's true of all ceratopsians you know you would think uh, or, or you would imagine i certainly am almost confused by the fact that we've never found a ceratopsian which basically doesn't have any of this stuff once they've evolved it every single species has it and yet you look at the obvious analog of things like an uh, antelope and cattle and buffaloes and sheep and goats there are various species where either the female has a dramatically different set of horns or just doesn't have them at all. And we just don't see that. All ceratopsians have gone for this I need to signal stuff route. Previously, you said when we did the ceratops e triceratops episode, you said that uh, that they were probably not going around in large herds and they were solitary. And this is partly why you could prove that the horns, they fought each other and that sort of thing. So the fact that they don't have these horns for fighting, does that suggest that these are more herd animals? Uh, not necessarily, because things like um, buffalo are quite happy to fight each other quite often, and they have lots of horns, same with lots of sheep uh, and things like that. But what we do have here is lots of examples of where we have found groups of them together. Um, and there's there's kind of four main cases for this. Uh, the first one, annoyingly, is either was never dug up or has been lost somewhere. So there was an expedition in uh, China or Mongolia in the kind of late 80s, early 90s and there's a whole bunch of com combined project between the Chinese and the Canadians as the Sino-Canadian Dinosaur Project and in one of their big reports they discuss finding this mass mortality site of loads of protoceratops and then the report wanders off and doesn't mention it again and it's like that'd be really useful to know <laughs> Could we have some more information on that, please? And while I was in, Ch I had, I had three years in China at the IVPP, Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in Beijing, where the, though this project was based. And I went through their catalogue and they went, Oh, we might have it in a warehouse somewhere. Oh. So that's the first one, but we know of it's recorded. There are people who saw it and I've spoken to one of the paleontologists who was on that expedition. He went, Oh yeah, there were loads of them. Did you take any photos? Oh, I didn't. Um, mm -hmm. God. Okay. But it, it's, it's, I think it's fair to say it's verifiably existed. Uh, the second one is just a pair of animals lying side by side. Aww. One about a foot in front of the other. Well, they're one, each unfortunately, other. no, and and one's almost eroded. So one is a basically complete skeleton, and then the next one is just a nose, uh, and the rest of it eroded. <laughs> But you can see that it's a no, it's the front half of a skull, it's exactly the same size, and it's literally touching the animal sitting next to it. So, the, and though, those are animals we would call sub adults, or in humoring terms, basically teenagers. So, not quite full size yet, but have grown their big frill, were probably sexually mature. Did you call the specimens Romeo and Juliet to be romantic and dying in each other's arms? And no, that your face is no. suggesting <laughs> trying to get on and talk some sciences. Either. Stop <laughs> anthropomorphizing everything. I just think it's a beautiful story of two teenage lovers <laughs> dying and then being preserved forever <laughs> for the scientists to not write down their happy story. Well, one in a bit of them. <laughs> They weren't all preserved. Just a nose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it, yeah, Romeo and... <laughs> 
So that's the second one. So we've got a big group of adults. Then we've got some pair of sub-adults together. And the third one is one I got to work on, um, which is absolutely amazing. And that's four kind of mid-sized babies. They'd have been 70 centimeters long or so, snout to tail. Four of them in a big pile, like climbing over the top of each other. Uh, and the interpretation we had of this was that basically this was some kind of sand dune collapse and they're trying to get out. They're all pointing oh, upward no. and they've all got their mouths open and they're like that's standing sad. on top of each other. And yeah, we, we think they got buried and that, that's what killed them. Um, and then the final one is a group of, it's something like about 23. It's a, it's a massive number and they're all absolutely <gasps> diddy, like 15, 20 centimeters long snout to tail so in like a big a circle. Nest or something. Thing. Uh that so it was they were described as being nestlings or animals still living in a nest. I'm rather unconvinced because they're a bit too big for that. Hang on, they're a bit too big at that stage. I mean, how big were they when they came out if they're only 20 centimetres long? How well, big were the eggs? Well, not very big. Again, Protoceratops is not a particularly big animal. You know, those eggs are going to be... I mean, I've seen Protoceratops eggs. Uh, I'm desperately... I'm holding my hand up to the screen. And a couple pr- of chicken to, eggs. Yeah, or a, bit bigger, a couple That's of goose what- eggs side by side or end to end. So big, mm. but not massive. Yeah, the we, we again we do have embryos now. We can get we already had eggs, and you can get estimates of embryo of hatchling size from egg volume because we have an idea of that. They're fairly big. Now that's not impossible. They hatched out then out of the egg and then sat in the nest, and mum and dad looked after them. We know that's true of other dinosaurs. There's things like Myasaura that absolutely did that. We have huge babies in nests, which must have been there for weeks or months, um, for example. Um, but they are rather big. Um, and then also, so the uh, the argument was they're very small and they're in a limited area. And it's like, well, they're a bit too big for being true hatchlings, or at least certainly having just come out of the egg. And if you go to that bit of China or Mongolia, there are these natural little depressions absolutely everywhere. Um, and they're not dinosaur nests. It's just the way the rock tends to erode. And if you're a small animal looking for shelter, that's probably the kind of place that you're going to hang around. And again, it, they've all died virtually instantly in a sand dune collapse of from a sandstorm. So it's exactly the place you might expect them to take shelter if there was something nasty going on. So what amazes me about this is hang on, so this is what, seventy five million years ago. Yeah, give or take. And the landscape hasn't changed much. No, it's it's really quite weird. Um when I was out in Inner Mongolia uh with a paleontologist called Jim Clark, because it one of the first time I ever went out there, um and he, Jim had worked there for, and he's worked there for decades now at this point. And, and I asked him, he's so like, you know, what did this look like 70 million years ago? And he went, about like this. <laughs> Um, crazy. Yeah, uh, I, th- I think the key difference is in places, um, it was actually very green. So I think uh, for to put most people in context with it, to think of something like the Nile Delta or, or the Nile, you know, when we think of the Nile, you know, going through Cairo. Yeah, lots of water there and immediately on the banks, very, very green, lush and verdant, but you don't have to go very far and suddenly it's scrub and then desert and then very, very little. Um, and so most of this area, yeah, Yes, it's going to be very, very sandy and bits of grass or, or ferns or whatever else was around back then and trees and we find fossil wood and stuff like this. But mostly those that vegetation was few and far between or at best it was very dry, scrubby stuff like you'd see in, you know, US desert whenever you see people driving through Nevada on, in, in movies and TV. Um, and yeah, certainly big sand dunes in places. But there were areas which would have been very green indeed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically just a big desert. And so, yeah, it's very easy for these things to get buried and stuff like that. But it means going back to the kind of social side of things, we've now got four different age groups, young babies, mid-sized babies, sub-adults and adults, all known in groups. Now we've got loads of odd individuals as well, but okay, just because animals, even if animals live in groups constantly, it's not like it's very often that the whole group dies at once. What mostly happen is you'll die one at a time. Um, on the flip side of that, lots of animals that live in groups will also be solitary at times or regularly you know deer females often go around in groups while stags run around on their own or stags live in stag centric groups lions famously we think of them as living in prides but males while they're maturing go through this phase of basically being solitary and wandering around on their own or with a couple of brothers they have a lot of bro love they have a lot they of bro do love. uh There's- right but it's but is you know just because you have groups doesn't mean that these animals just lived in groups the whole time they might be doing other things as well 
But in the case of protoceratops, you can make a fairly solid case for them forming groups multiple times, or this being a fairly important part of their life at multiple different age stages. Uh, and I think that's the only dinosaur you can say that for with any confidence at all, uh, which is therefore oh, wow. really quite interesting and important. Because... Well, previously when we talked about the massive egg fields and stuff, it suggests that you do get like the big sauropods herding a bit, even only at those times. Well, that's the, but that's the eggs. thing. I mean, there, there's a huge difference between coming together to mate or coming together to lay eggs and actually living together. You know, you see those mass, uh, you know, nestings of turtles, and they're all coming up onto the beach in huge numbers. But when that night is over, they go back into the sea and sod off and they may not see another turtle for months at a time. It's very hard to call them living in groups because of that one event. Fair enough. So what I, I'm still obsessed with these, with with their anatomy, really. I mean, I don't understand the point of, you know, having these sort of cheeks and the shape of them in general. I mean, if they're not... What were they doing? I mean, do we know anything about their lifestyles or the way they were living? I mean, lifestyles. Living. <laughs> they living in an 80s magazine. Yeah. <laughs> They're probably just hanging around in the desert. Again, pe people have this kind of false idea of what they eating in a like. desert? Well, right, but it's... Again, it's just because they're hanging around in big sand dunes doesn't mean that they live there and don't eat anything. Again, it's it's not too hard to go online and find beautiful photos of even animals like giraffes and elephants and lions right in the middle of a desert, sand dune as far as the eye can see. You think, why on earth are they out then? It's like, well, because they're moving from point A to point B and the only thing between them is sand dunes. So guess what they're doing? Um, and yeah, there would have been lush areas, but that doesn't mean that they don't have to constantly gravitate from one to the other. Predators are far more likely to hang around where there's water, for example, so it might be a very good idea if you can mostly survive on very scrubby rubbish food. And they were herbivores. That's... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just making sure I got that. Because de you did mention little fangs, so I just wanted to clear that up. We think that those might be either to do with signalling, or you mentioned muntjac, maybe they're fighting with them. You know, no other ceratopsian has these. There's no particular reason to think that they're critical to food collection or anything like that, including in another species of protoceratops that basically lives in the same environment. Um, it's quite possible that this is something else that they're either showing off or even actually biting each other with them uh, and the beak is already quite sharp but stick a couple of fangs behind it and maybe you can do a bit more damage it's they were suggested to potentially be nocturnal at one point have they got whiskers and big eyes no but they've got pretty big eyes for their size um okay that's possible not least given that obviously the desert is very hot and being able to get out of the sun in the day and being active mostly at night might not be a bad idea i think that's plausible though i'm not entirely convinced the other thing that's been suggested for them is that they burrowed. Ooh. Yeah. What? Hang on. Yeah, and they look <laughs> a bit big for it, is the, is the obvious point. Um, yeah. So there's a couple of reasons for this. The, um, and the first one is that we keep finding specimens of protoceratops, not quite vertically in the rock, but certainly at quite a steep angle. Um, and there's a bunch of them with the, with their noses missing. So they're found. This, this is, it's always a pain. For, I, I know, I know a couple of paleontologists who've dug these things up and they absolutely hate them. So you're walking along and you find a scattering of bones on the surface. And we said before that that's really great. You know, that's what you want. There's a skeleton underneath, but normally that means it's going into the hillside. And when you find it's Not the tip down. of a protoceratops nose, you've got to dig down. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I've seen several protoceratops with basically the nose missing and the rest of it is perfect. So, I mean, they could have been, like, in my head, I'm just like, well, that just meant that they died on the tippiness of their tails. Um, could they balance like that? No, that wouldn't work. So, well, suggested they're burrowing. So bear in mind, we've excavated a few of these and burrows usually show up. There are paleontology burrows. Um, we, we, we mentioned it. Yeah, you're, you're doing a spiral thing. So, Ages ago, um, I think it was when Alice was on and I mentioned Paleocaster and said it was a giant beaver and I got that wrong. Uh, there's a different beaver, which is the giant beaver. Paleocaster is one of the burrowing beavers. And again, we have fossil burrows for Paleocaster and they're a big spiral. They're, they're a vertical column and then a big spiral. You find these. We even have, we even have some fossil burrows with dinosaurs in them. So it's not like these things wouldn't preserve and certainly wouldn't preserve multiple times. And yet we've excavated these vertically orientated Protoceratops, and we keep not finding them in burrow structures. So that suggests to me that actually what's happening is they are being buried in sand dune collapses, or they're climbing up sand dunes, or the reason they're vertical is they got covered and they're trying to worm their way out and don't make it. 
They don't have any obvious adaptations for digging or burrowing at all anywhere. And they're a really awkward shape for that because this big head means you have to dig a really big hole to actually fit into. You could use your chin spikes to sort of scoop, <laughs> um, but not really. But, yeah, but, but You'd be not scooping really. it into your own face. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you lay on your back, you could use your little sh- um, your little um, frill as a shovel, you know, sort of. But it would be just flicking it back up. Well, you need face, someone else to drag so. you backwards. So, uh, t- tail paddle. There you go. If one of them flips over, digs the frill in. The other one grabs the tail and drags him out. Oh, there you go. Um, I was I was also wondering, um, just because it occurred to me, uh, the frill. I mean, could that be used for audio? I mean, for hearing better, or is there some sort of? Are they elaborate ears in any way? But they're facing the wrong way, aren't they? Yeah, the, the ear openings are basically behind the frill, effectively below and behind. But like, couldn't couldn't the back of the frill be like hearing what's happening behind you? If people are whispering behind your back. Probably not, because you've got the shoulders and the back in the way. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. It's just an idea. It's just an idea. Making sure you've covered all your ground. See, the, the, I think the key thing in all of this is dinosaurs are really weird. And <laughs> even our, right, so so big thing we do when we talk about behaviour and we talk about anatomy is com- comparative anatomy. You know, we want to look at other animals and try and use them for a model. And for big things like swimming or burrowing, we've got really good examples. You know, if you, I've I've had just had a student of mine for her undergraduate dissertation. She did a great job, and she was looking at burrowing adaptations. And you see things in the claws and in the wrist and in the fingers and in the elbow and in the shoulders and in the vertebrae and in the ribs and you see these again and again and again in completely different animals because it's evolved repeatedly because you need these things if you're going to dig effectively and so if you basically don't find any of those features it's really not a good case that this thing can dig you can dig without it we have no digging adaptations but you can still go to the beach with your hands to excavate a hole but that's clearly not something you've adapted for and are specialist for i've adapted for digging in conversations quite a lot that's hey. <laughs> um before we uh, go to our interview what i really want to ask you about in a way just simply because it's it seems strange to me that it is so small the size of this thing why is it so small because compared to other ceratopsians it is i mean too meters is not big yeah so my guess is because mostly the environment it's in doesn't support much bigger animals so there are some big animals around at this time there is um a a hadrosaur called saurolophus which gets pretty big there are a couple of sauropods out there and there's tarbosaurus the big t-rex um sister basically it's the nearest thing to t-rex that uh that, that we know of um but uh, to my knowledge, they mostly don't overlap with Velociraptor and Protoceratops. They're around at the kind of same, roughly the same time and in roughly the same places. But if you're finding one, you're not usually finding the other. And so that suggests to me that we're talking about animals that are more in the deeper desert, let's say, where there is less food and therefore it's not going to support really big animals. Either that or there's just a division of the, you know, a division of food and Saurolophus and the Hadros and the, and the Saurolophus pods have nailed down getting onto the big plants and if you can't feed on the big plants because they're already doing it well you're gonna have to focus on the smaller stuff and then that leaves you being smaller are they heat adapted in that way though so if there is if, if you're right and you know there is a big environmental difference between the big dinosaurs and the little dinosaurs so there's food's not very you know there's not much about there's not much water about um then you're going to want to get rid of a lot of extra body heat so would a frill and would that extra tail just that expansion of extra skin have that adaptation for that maybe but i don't think it's the primary one so again we you know talking about co-option and, and multiple functions and that this is another case it, it probably would help yeah and i i it certainly wouldn't harm in that case but we have lots of ceratopsians living in cold environments that have the same features <sighs> or in medium yeah. environments or or doing other things or different sizes or a bigger or a smaller it's not something that you only see in protoceratops bagoceratops and, and these other desert dwellers um so it is a possible function it is very unlikely to be the reason that it evolved in the first place and the reason it got to the size and shape that it is cool well let us um i know that we had um um we've we've got another guest on i know we keep doing this um it's it's awfully rude of us that we're chatting along happily and then we go and invite someone into the conversation yes but he isn't just any guest he is the mobo multi-award winning british rapper faith child who i met in a on a tv show once where we were asked to argue me being atheist and he being christian and we got along it was a really bad tv show but here he is the wonderful faith child 
So I, I think as a child, you're always interested because you have animals like Barney, you know, when you're growing up. So you've got this <laughs> kind of thing and you've got Jurassic Park, which I call Jurassic Park nice. for like 28 years of my life. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think my interest or rather my fascination, I rather put, of dinosaurs uh, kind of whitt- whittled, uh, kind of withered away only because a lot of the content I was fed as a child, it kind of stopped, you know. Um, obviously, Discovery Channel's there, but they don't really focus much on dinosaurs, to my knowledge, more. Or not, not anymore. Not, not when they can do shows about people restoring cars, which is obviously yeah. history. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so my, my knowledge of dinosaurs is are quite limited, which I think is great. So I can learn on this show and I guess ask some questions on this show. Yeah. Well. Do you have one? Do you have one that you've sort of like, you want to start with? Um, I would like to know like how close, I guess, are humans to dinosaurs? Ooh. You know? E- evolutionarily or in time? Just how, yeah. Okay. Help me lay this up, Izzy. Okay. I think what you're asking, you're not asking like how long ago that we're here now, how far in the past until we got here. You're asking if you followed your dad and your dad and your dad and your dad and your dad all the way back, how far back do you go before we have a common ancestor with a dinosaur? That can be. That can be. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I don't know because we're actually have to go so far back. We're going out of the time that I usually Ooh. deal with. Um, so it will be in a time period called the Permian. So dinosaurs lived in an era called the Mesozoic, which is the Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous. And before the Triassic was the Permian. So we're already going back to the Permian. And at some point in the Permian, we had a split between two groups. Uh, So this is a group of uh, vertebrates, so animals with backbones and skulls and teeth. Um, And and they're a group called the Amniotes. And these are things that have an amnion, which in us is the amniotic sac uh, during pregnancy. Ah. But in reptiles, there is an amnion in the egg. Um, and indeed, you get some things like uh, there is various snakes that give birth to live young who've got rid of the shell while it's still inside the mother. And therefore, they have something that's much closer to a kind of mammalian pregnancy than a classic reptile egg. But the amnion is this, is this key characteristic uh, which allowed these animals to basically um, do well in dry environments, that plus their skin. So we've now moved on from amphibians with moist skin who don't like drying out to things with either to scaly skin at this point. Uh, and the uh, the early amniotes split into two branches. And one was the sauropsids, which go on to produce reptiles, and therefore lizards and snakes and turtles and crocodiles and eventually dinosaurs and other things. And the other group was the synapsids, which went on to produce a whole bunch of really weird things and eventually mammals. Um, so, go yeah, synapsids, go, go synapsids. Oh, yeah, team yeah. synapsids. <laughs> so, so, so one of the classic early synapses is a thing called Dimetrodon, which everyone always thinks is a dinosaur but isn't because it's got a great big sail on its back and it looks really reptilian and scaly and has a... Actually, we now think it walked upright, but it, it's always shown as having this very kind of reptilian bent arms shuffling along with the whole body wobbling yeah. just like a, a fat lizard. And you always... Whenever you got, you know, your uh, cereal with your little toys or your pack of 27 dinosaurs, dinosaur figures that are only an inch long each one of them was always dimetrodon even though it's a synapsid and comes from uh, i think about 50 million years before the dinosaurs wow. and is ultimately closer to mammals than than reptiles as well but apart from that it's a great inclusion um, <laughs> So, yeah, give or take, I think it's about 280 million years that you've got the synapsid sauropsid split. And so, therefore, the split, which the nearest split between dinosaurs on the one hand and mammals and therefore us on the other. You just... But I'd really have to look that date up because I don't know it off the well, top of my head. Well, we can do head. corrections. I mean, you know, we're asking yeah, we're, we're, you to go back in time and work out the division. We'll fix that. We'll, but it is, it is that, we'll drop it that's in the in main post. division between sort of reptiles and birds and mammals and other things. Yeah, that, that, is, that is the big one. Yeah, and, and the important thing is and other things because people obviously tend to remember this as being, oh, it's mammals versus reptiles. It's like, well... Actually, the early synapsids aren't mammals and the early sauropsids aren't reptiles yet. Oh. Those are an own division. 
Yeah, I know. This is the problem. We're trying to catalogue everything. It's... You know, the, the, chemi- the chemists only have, what, 280 elements. We've got somewhere around estimated 1.1 billion species alive now. It, there's a lot of names. <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. <laughs> but it's weird that, you know, even though you have that division that early on, that there's so much that's still similar. So some of the characteristics, for example, most dinosaurs have four arms and back legs. We've got four legs. We've got two eyes. They almost all have two eyes. You know, there's so two many eye- yeah. really common. So the fact that it took that long and we're very, very different, but we're not that different just shows how much time you know how how much to get a big difference between things how much time you need but but the flip side of that is things can happen very very quickly snakes lost their legs very quickly the once things started coming on land they changed very quickly i guess it's also that that's part of it but the flip side of that is 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 what what works uh you know two eyes is a really good system because it gives you binocular vision which gives you distance um and if that's working evolution isn't going to change it anytime soon there's there's going to be no natural selection operating to go down to one eye or to add a bunch of eyes because the other thing is you know it's very complicated to process all of that a big part of your brain is devoted to the fact that you've got two different things coming at you so even if you somehow evolved four you might then need a huge brain to process it all and that might be very complicated information and then you need a lot more food and then you need a much bigger head and that actually doesn't work very well. So, yeah, some things are really fundamental simply because they work well. Um, and it's, it, you know, eyes are a great example. Eyes have evolved many, many times. Lots of different animals have eyes that they evolved entirely independently from us. So uh, cephalopods, the octopus, cuttlefish, nautilus, squid, they all run off two eyes, the same as us, in roughly the same place, doing roughly the same job in roughly the same way. They they have a lens construction the same they as us. They have wibbly pupils, so, though. They do have wibbly pupils. They do. It's weird. They do. Um, <laughs> yeah, you get the W-shaped pupils, which, again, some geckos have. Oh, so what? So these things turn up again and yeah. again. And even, well, and goats have that weird kind of slit with a dot in the middle, which isn't a million miles off the W. Yeah. Um, so yeah, these things just come, if they work, if you're starting with the same basic ingredient and they work, they will probably come round again. It's crazy. How, how does, in regards to evolution, like how does an, I guess a dinosaur, how, how, how do they just create another part of their body? Like you mentioned the whole eyes thing, like what has been one of the most drastic evolutions of a dinosaur, maybe like growing an additional tusk or something or... Yeah, uh, so, most, so, yeah. so we have all my, well, I was going to say almost all animals. There's a huge swathe of evolutionary history. I'm going to be a bit vague because I'm going so far back, I don't know where this stops. <laughs> and I don't want to say the wrong thing. A vast number of animals that have things called Hox genes, H-O-X. And these are a little segment of your DNA that basically have a huge amount of, to do with your development. And so when you're just a bundle of cells telling which cells to turn into which body parts. Yeah. And these are so incredibly consistent. You can, scientists have done this. You can literally get them from mammals and drop them into flies and you still develop a fly because they're basically saying, if you're at the front, go to step two. If you're in the middle, go to step three. And if yeah. you're at the end, go to step four kind of thing. And therefore, as long as they say that, inverted commas say that, um, then they work fine. And so that's incredibly conservative bit of evolution. You know, if you deviate from that, you tend to mess up the animal. And we see that if you if you mess around with them experimentally, um, you get things like flies that grow legs on their eyes. Oh. Um, and hor- yeah, weird things like this. Or they turn antennae into legs. Or they turn legs into antennae. Because it's, sim- it's almost like an instruction. It's like an Ikea instruction manual. It really <laughs> is. Where it's kind of like, right, step four, or go to page 17, build that thing and put it here. And if you then say, instead of page 17, go to page 19, then it will build the wrong thing in the right place in its entirety. So it's that one little change can take you down a whole different pathway. Wow. And so a lot of what's going on with big changes on animals is changes to changes to stuff like the Hox genes or the stuff that they then tell to go and do. So uh, when you get duplications of these, so when you say, instead of build one thing, it now says, you know, step one, build this. Step two becomes build this again. Um, and so you end up with an immediate duplication of something. I mean, you see this a lot in invertebrates. 
So if you look at things like, um, you know, ants, they have lots of body segments. And actually, or lobsters are an even better example. You know, they've, got a, they've either got an antennae, that their body's made up of loads of segments, and they've even got an antenna or a little bit of mouth part that does something, or pinches, or a pair of legs, or their little swimmy things at the back. <laughs> but each segment of the lobster is actually almost a repeating unit. They're very similar to each other. Yeah. And so it's merely almost a question of saying... Don't build legs here, build more swimmy things, or build less swimmy things and build more legs, <laughs> or make the legs longer. And you can completely change the pattern and shape of your animal just by changing a couple of little details in that kind of set of root instructions. And what changes um, those instructions, though? What's the feed? What's happening? Well, so it's it's mutation. It's it's straight up chance during during cell division. Yeah, some things get added or deleted or duplicated or um, cut out or or they fundamentally change so they don't say quite what they used to anymore. Um, and that's a huge amount of that. And, and hybridization is massively overlooked as well. So we, we're taught at school that a species is something that can't breed with another species. <laughs> that's a definition, and it's an absolutely appalling one, uh, because things crossbreed all the time, um, particularly if they're very close relatives. And then, you, you know, we, we see this with dogs. You know, yes, dogs are domesticated, and we've, we've split them up and done very weird things with them very recently, but the same general principle applies. You know, you've got great big long-legged greyhounds and tiny little short-legged stump-nosed pugs. Well, strangely enough, if you put them together, you'll get something that's neither one nor the other. And if you then crossbreed that with something else, you can get something else again. Um, and so you can soon package together these subtle differences of instructions. And again, it's not just the hox genes, it's stuff further down the line, which is making legs longer or shorter and five toes versus four toes and a long tail or a short tail and stuff like this. And soon build quite a different animal, potentially, um, where two populations meet. Um, plants, plants are a nightmare for this. You can <laughs> yeah. hybridize all kinds of plants that shouldn't breed. You know, they're, they're so wildly different, you can't possibly believe they can breed with each other, and yet they do, and then produce a new species which is like neither parent. This is, this, the estimate is something like 30% of plant species have been produced by hybridizing two other species. <laughs> in, in the wild, this isn't anything to do with, you know, artificial selection and farmers messing around with crops. Just pollen gets taken by bees between one random plant and another random plant, and it turns out that works fine because plants are weirdly plastic and don't mind. Whereas for animals, of course, if your legs, if your muscles on your arm aren't built quite right, you'll never move your arm, which means you'll never walk and then you'll die very quickly. Whereas plants just kind of stick branches up willy nilly and don't care quite how big their roots are or where they go or things like this. And so they're much, much, much more flexible and don't have the complexity of organs. So plants can hybridize really well. Animals mostly can't. But that's another important mechanism of driving changes and allowing new things to be produced. It's brilliant. It's bizarre. I mean, we're also hybrids, technically. I mean, because we've got Neanderthal genes, yeah. you know, floating around. And you've the got Denizovans. that weird lump on the back so... of your heads. And if you've got white skin, you're yes. almost certainly, <laughs> I'm afraid, part Neanderthal, which is depressing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so is, is he's referencing the fact that I do have a weird he lump does. on the back of my skull? <laughs> and on the front, to be She's... fair. It's a very... <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's my nose. Is oh, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, 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 you know, modern modern Homo sapiens sapiens, which is what we regard the modern human race to be, as opposed to our ancient ancestors. Yeah, we, we definitely hybridized in the past with Neanderthals and this obscure group in um kind of the Tibet region and, and Russia called the Denisovans, which we don't know very much about at all. We found almost no fossils, but we've got a really good genetic sequence out of the fossils that we've got. And lo and behold, they've got a whole suite of genes in humans, which we never quite knew where they came from. And it turned out they're Denisovan. So yeah, we are hybrids of multiple different early hominid lineages that interbred at some level. It's always that weird thing with me. It, it, it feels really weird because we're so different to other animals. And we sort of look at the great apes and we think, okay, we're kind of similar. But there were loads of like animals like us that weren't us. Mm. So like 
like Nanzals, like Hyperbergensis, like uh, Homo florensis, and that sort of thing. And yeah, and the fact that we're the only surviving ones, it's it's a bit like coming across a fox and there being no other dogs, you know, or wolves. Or <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that it, it, it's that kind of thing, you know. The, the birds are a great one in that context. You know, we we took a very long time to work out the birds are dinosaurs because they look nothing like anything else on Earth apart from as you say, the basics of well, they've got legs and feet and. A skeleton is like, but after that, where the feathers come from? Where are the beaks? Why do their feet look like that? They've got these weird lungs and they're full of air. What on earth are they? And it's only when you find all those fossils that show all the changes that it becomes very obvious. Whales are another one. We're a very long time before we knew what whales were. And we now know they're basically derived from something close to early antelope and hippos, which is not obvious from a <laughs> whale. It is obvious when you find this thing from India called Indo highest which is like it looks kind of like a big rat to be quite honest um but indo highest has this very unique set of bones in the ankles which we only ever see in antelope and hippos and their near relatives and then there is a animal which is still a lot like indo highest but has now moved its nostrils from the front of its nose to the top of its head and has started to reduce its legs and have a paddle. And you're like, okay, so now we've got an antelope thing, an antelope thing that can probably swim very well, and a sub-antelope sub-whale thing. <laughs> and suddenly you can put the chain together Work and you can out. really see where these animals have come from. Because otherwise, wait, yeah, once, once all those other ones have gone extinct, like you said, individual species or individual lineages can look really really wild when 20 million years 50 million 100 million years ago they were surrounded by relatives and it would have been obvious to anyone living at the time that all these things were related to each other yeah it's so bizarre it's so hard to get your head around (laughs) (laughs) extinction happens all the time this is true Uh, uh, that's the that's the short new species arrive and old things go extinct and yeah and it's not just the humans you know there's fossil chimpanzees, there's fossil gorillas, there's things like Gigantopithecus, which was this monstrous ape, you know, twice the size of a gorilla that lived in India, China, Himalayas region. <gasps> Yeti! You know, absolutely monstrous thing that's now extinct, <laughs> sadly. Yeah, and, and again, if we go back a few million years and all they were around, then again, it would the, the hominid tree, the wider hominid tree with all of the big apes, looks a lot less distinct because you've got various intermediates and closer relatives to things but we are the best slash luckiest well we've done quite well with what is it seven billion of us <laughs> <We're doing all laughs> <right>. <laughs> yeah when when gorillas are down to a few ten thousand oh, i think at this point it's sad. uh yeah i know it's terrible know. yeah yeah it is <laughs> but... don't know why i'm laughing <laughs> <laughs> well, it's awkward tension. It's what laughter is. The 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 the, yeah. the evolutionary purpose of laughter, they think, is to show you know when you tickle, you get tickled, and how that is not yeah. funny yet you laugh. It's literally yeah. yes. a physical response to show that you mean no harm, and therefore please don't hurt me. So literally, when you're laughing, you just go, "Don't hurt me! I fit in. Please help." <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's what I try and get people to do for a living is to make people. I was going to yeah. say you could, that that would be fun to test out in your next jujitsu session. Oh yeah, no. No, that is true. You do get people giggling when it's all going wrong because people, yeah, <laughs> it's an odd reaction. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was brilliant. Thanks so much, Faye. That's all right, mate. Thank you for giving us your time. Yeah. I find that really interesting. This is why I like natural history, I think. Um, Big thank you to Faith there. It's because, you know, we sort of think, oh, to find out about dinosaurs, you need to sort of dig in the ground. But actually, you really just need to look around you and you can see animal behaviour everywhere. And that tells us so much about what would have happened in the past. Yeah, no, but that, that, that really is it. I mean, it's... There's this um, famous line in paleontology, which I think comes from Charles Lyell, or at least a, a version of his that is being translated, and it's that the the, the present is the key to the past. Um, you know, fundamental physical processes basically work the same. You know, mountains rise and fall, rivers erode and deposit. Um, heat will exchange it certain ways. If you're going to grow a plant, you need heat and light and CO2 and some water. And, you know, and these things are all true. And so the same way, you know, talking about burrowing, the reason we have these adaptations in animals again and again and again is because levers and mechanics and joints and muscles all work the same way. And soil is soil. And yes, there's harder and softer types, but there's only certain ways you can actually move that stuff. And so there's no reason to think 
that dinosaurs would have magically evolved some completely different way of digging, different to what you see in snakes and lizards and <laughs> moles and aardvarks and pangolins and all these other different groups. Um, and so, yeah, when we look at modern animals, those are one of the central things that we have to look at if we want to interpret the fossil record. It's a bit like um, the Star Trek excuse why all the aliens have like two arms, two legs and one head is... Oh, well, it's this the most efficient shape that naturally occurs and reoccurs and keeps occurring throughout the galaxy. Except That's... for that episode in The Next Generation where it turns out that the universe was seeded with some kind of thing that yeah, meant but... that genetically they're all related to each other because I, I am enough of a nerd to know that. Well, I was, go- I was going to say, I'm just talking, you know, <laughs> Kirk and the original series, okay? That's, you know, yeah. Nanu Nanu. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> We've done so well to get this far without upsetting people. <laughs> Anyway, um, thank you very much um, for listening to this episode. Um, do support us on Patreon. Um, we've also got some merchandise which you can find on our website. I'm going to say all of this in the outro, but I don't know if you listen to the outro. Sometimes I don't bother. So until next week, we will say... Rawr, rawr. Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast. For bonus episodes and extra content, please visit our Patreon page. You can also purchase a mug, t-shirt or a Terrible Lizard face mask from Redbubble. Go to terriblelizards.co.uk for links. Send us your questions. Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook and Twitter. Include the hashtag terriblelizards. We hope to bring you more and more, but we can only do that if we get enough listeners. So So please like, share, leave a review and subscribe. I feel like I have more money when I make less. I've been counting, doing the math for my account and the money don't make sense. I see crazy figures that I spent on dinners, can I get a witness? Preach. And everybody's trying to holler, trying to run up on a rubber one to make a couple dollars off me. What are the benefits if you get everything and then you lose your soul? You can't take anything when they are burying you, you ain't a funeral. I want to do a better, gonna do a better, get lower together for the two.